I'm Rob Crum from Ruckus Wireless. Uh, my boss is Jared Griffith, and he, he was actually supposed to be here this morning to deliver this keynote, uh, but he's a little bit delayed in, in the U.S., so he, he phoned me yesterday and said, hey, can you do this? Uh, so if I look like I haven't ironed my clothing, it's because I haven't. Um, it's, it's, uh, I, I came here expecting to do 10 minutes worth of talking, and I'm now doing an hour and 10, or maybe more, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, but yeah, so the presentation we're giving you today is just going to talk around uh, what we've been doing with our stadiums. Uh, and, and how we go about validating those. So we're obviously not going to share all of the details. We're going to lift our skirts a little bit and show you kind of what we do uh, and some of the trouble we've run into. So uh, most of the work we've done on stadiums this year has been with my colleague Michal, um, sitting over here as well. So we, we ended up in India for two months earlier this year, and we did eight uh, cricket stadiums uh, in, in that country, and we've, we've done a couple of others since then. So anyway, let's... Uh, Let's take you through that. So these are just some of the projects we've completed as a team um, over the last couple of years. So we did the, the four stadiums for the 2014 World Cup um, in Brazil. Uh, we've done eight stadiums in India for the IPL and the T20. Does anyone know here roughly what cricket is or do you need a primer on it? Okay, so I've got two people who know what cricket is. That's fantastic. Right. All you need to know is that cricket is the more complicated, boring version of baseball and it is bigger than American football in India, okay? It is the number one thing that people go and hang out and watch on their weekends. If, if you're going to support a sports team in India, it has to be a cricket team. There is no other sport uh, not known to those people. So it, it's a pretty big thing. And then obviously a rugby stadium in South Africa, which is just like, you know, pretty obvious. Uh, that, that's our big thing, right? Okay, so the first question is, I mean... Why validate? And I, I suppose that's a little bit of a stupid question talking to a group of wireless LAN professionals, but the, the question does need asking just to put us all on the same page. So what is our motivation when we go in to validate a, a big network? And, and what are we trying to, trying to do? So the first thing I thought of was, was this, right? So the thing is, when you go and you sit down and you do your pretty little RF plan and you get those nice images from Ekahau and they're great images, right? It looks cool. And you do your capacity plan and you use all kind of tools that you find out in the industry there by, you know, there's Andrew Von Nagy's um, Wi-Fi capacity planner and all of these things. The first thing you have to realize is everything you've put in there is an assumption and all of your reasoning is based on top of it. So, I mean... That's the first problem, right? So let's just, uh, I, I wrote down a list here, so I'm going to stand up and, and read it to you because I'm not actually that good at public speaking. Um, but the thing is, <laughs> but, but here's the trick, right? When, when you're doing all of your assumptions, you're assuming that a certain amount of spectrum is available. You're assuming that you're going to get a certain de client device distribution. Uh, you're assuming that you're going to get some kind of split between 5 gig and 2.4. Uh, you're assuming that there's not going to be any interference or there might be or, you know, the only stuff that people have told you about, not the stuff that no one's told you about. Uh, you haven't found out anything about what the press wants to use down at the boxes. You haven't found out anything about what the team uses when they communicate with each other or what the coach uses or anything like that. So you, you kind of have to work with this. Uh, you don't know if there's any kind of Bluetooth or Zigbee or other garbage kind of hanging around. Um, you, you've also got your own assumptions about what the antenna gain patterns look like, right? So you've gone and spec, let's say, um, a high gain antenna for, a, for an overhead deployment, and you've read the polar charts, and you've, you've kind of gone, okay, so this is what my side lobe looks like, but you still don't really have a fundamental understanding of what that's going to do when you have a crowd in the, in the room, or if you remove the crowd, or you know, anything like that. So th those kind of things, it's we're kind of 80% of the way there when we do our design, but we're never quite 100% of the way there. There's always going to be something that comes up, and the number of things that can come up is quite surprising. Uh, and then, of course, there's always the things you missed in, in your design. So you did your design, you did the whole thing, and uh, you didn't quite check everything, did you? Right. Okay. So that's, that's the first problem. And just to give you an idea here, it's okay to get these kind of assumptions wrong. Here's a client distribution between two different countries, right? So this was Brazil on the right, and this was India on the left. In Brazil, 53% Apple, 26% Android, 20% other stuff, right? So 75% of our client devices, pretty easy to work with, actually more, 79%, right? So 80% of our client devices, pretty easy. When we went to India, about 
66% of it was Android. A big chunk of it was, gosh knows what, right? Just other stuff like old Nokias and Symbian 60 version 3 and things like that. And a very, very tiny sliver was actually Apple iOS. Now that gives us a massive problem because Apple iOS is, is quite easy to work with and their behavior is well documented. You know, I mean, you can go and look at how they roam and how they choose their next client access point and things like that and you get, get a rough idea. But when it comes to Android, how do I know? I don't know what hardware platform that's on. I don't know what vendor that's coming from. It's not Samsung in India, believe me. It's like Life and a whole bunch of others. So I don't even know what chipset these guys are using most of the time. So that's a big thing uh, that you'll find. Uh, I don't know why they're still using Windows Mobile 8, by the way. That's, that's really weird to me. But, um, you know, anyway, so, so that's the first thing is, you know, what kind of clients are you going to be dealing with? And as you go from country to country, you're going to see a very, very big difference. Um, the next thing is, you know, where are you in terms of all of your other assumptions? So your 2.4 your and 5 gig band split, um, your uplink and downlink traffic, it depends on the crowd at the time. Uh, if you go to a concert, you'll find that Snapchat is pretty popular because everyone likes taking selfies with little flowers around their heads and sending it to their girlfriend or their boyfriend, you know, all that kind of stuff. My parents do that. It's quite weird. They're in their 70s. Um, <laughs> uh, what, what kind of percentage concurrency are you looking at as well? So the usage will vary based on the event type. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have done sporting events, but what I've noticed is is that the longer the event is, the more likely people are to use their phones. So something like a basketball event, people are kind of paying attention to the game because the game's really fast-paced and it's over fairly quickly. So if I keep staring at my phone, I'll miss the game and there's no point in paying $200 to go and watch, you know, my favorite basketball player. Um, so so that's, that's the kind of idea. And then the other thing that you have to remember about all of this is the variance of these numbers. So you start off with this idea in your head and you go, yes, I will assume that 20% of my clients are on five gig or 2.4 gig or whatever. But it's a dynamic equilibrium. It fluctuates throughout the game. It changes throughout the day. The concurrency goes up and down depending on who's there and who's doing what and the kind of user behavior you're seeing. So that's just the kind of normal statistical thing. So where is your minimum and where is your maximum with, with all of these numbers, right? And then how do you design for that? So I'm assuming all of you choose the worst case scenario, but this is more about what is my worst case scenario and, and did I match that? Uh, and and that's, that's the, the other thing. So... This was something we ran into a lot when we started checking our designs for stadiums. So we, we went out and we did these designs and we had all of these assumptions and we would walk into stadiums that looked like this. Big, empty stadiums. And the customer would be saying, great, tell me that it works. I don't know. How do I do that? There's no one there. <laughs> it works fine now, <laughs> right? Um, but when it looks like this, it's a little bit different, right? So this is um, uh, Bangalore. Uh, I think this was West Indies versus Sri Lanka, and the whole crowd was screaming for Chris Gale, but none of you know who Chris Gale is, so that doesn't, you know, that doesn't help. <laughs> okay, Stuart knows, thank God. Okay, so th that's the, the major question. When are you validating and what tasks are you doing at different times? So what are you doing in an empty stadium to make sure that your design is good? Um, just so that when you do get an event, everything doesn't fall over and die. And then what are you doing in a busy stadium uh, to do that? And in a busy stadium, it's actually, there's, there's quite a lot to do, but it's, it's kind of simpler, softer stuff. Um, okay, so the other question is, what are you validating? What, what do you need to go and validate, right? I mean, it's Wi-Fi. So there's like what? There's transmit power, channel plan, like OFDM only. Minimum rates, that's, you know, surely that's it, right? Well, it turns out there's a whole bunch more than that. So, so your, your physical validation is actually where this all starts. And we, we've learned the hard way to start at a very, very basic level. So when we start talking about the physical validation, the first thing we ended up checking was 
AP placements and tilts. Okay, so the first thing we found was that there are physical obstructions and permissions problems in the stadiums. People kind of ended up missing the fact that they couldn't install access points where we told them to, so the installers had just gone and put them somewhere else, and we needed to go back and move them, or go and get permission, or go and make it work with the new with the new placement. So that that was the first thing. The second thing was the the antenna beam width. Um, so everyone loves to talk about 3 dB beam widths, right? 3 dB, 3 dB, it doesn't matter, right? What we found out is you want that beam width over there. You want 20 dB because that tells you where you can put your next access point on the same channel with your 20 dB SNR between two APs on the same one. So 3 dB is cute. I mean, everyone can go, yeah, this is a 30 degree beam width antenna. Show me where it hits 20. Show me what that beam width is. Because if you're using something like, uh, I know this is a vendor neutral conference, but the only real kit I really know about is, is Ruckus, so I'll use this example. If you're using one of the uh, T301Ss, that has a 120 degree 3 dB beam width. At 180 degrees, you're still getting 6 dBi of gain. Right? Right out to the sides. Like that. It's... It's an omni, right? <laughs> it's got a nice sector vertically and horizontally, it's, it's wide open. So, so that's the first thing you want to go and have a look at uh, when, you, when you're deploying. Um, the next thing is, um, am, is, is my furthest client still receiving the minimum RSSI? And, and we'll talk about what that is in a moment. But what is the minimum RSSI that you're supposed to be getting measured by what? Your laptop, your phone, the customer's phone, which phone is going to be the worst, right? And then that needs to be at least 20 dB higher than the noise floor when the stadium is empty. So how do you get to that point is, is another major trick. Um, so here, here are a couple of pictures that will show you the importance of AP placements and antenna tilts. Okay, So this was in India, and we we weren't able to deploy the APs behind. So if, if you actually have a look at the top of the image, you'll see the poles up there with, with the APs on the top facing down. That was the only place we were allowed to deploy. So that was just a restraint of the design. The customer said, well, that's the only place you can put them. Make it work. Went, okay, we'll try. Uh, and then luckily enough, actually, we weren't able to deploy behind the stadium here. So for the front rows, we ended up having to put these guys down. But if you look at how they've deployed them, you'll notice that these APs are all pointing up somewhere towards the sky and causing a huge amount of interference. So the AP tilts and, and antenna placements were, were fairly uh, wrong when we got there. And that's eventually how we, we optimized them. So we ended up pointing each of these antennas straight down into the lip of the concrete here and then walking up the stadium to make sure that by the time I got five or six rows up, I couldn't get the signal anymore. It had dropped off by the necessary amount, and I wasn't getting it pointed straight up at the APs behind, because in this picture, there are a whole bunch of APs pointed back down the stadium as well, so I needed to tilt those down as well, make sure that that was all right. So that's, that's the primary thing about antenna tilts and all of that. It, it's kind of counterintuitive. You, you don't really think that it's such an important thing. You go, ah, oh, the installers put it in correctly. Mm -mm. It's not, it's not the usual case. The installers don't really know that kind of stuff, and they just stick them up. So that's the first thing you've got to go and look at. All right. The next thing that doesn't really come to mind, AP labeling, right? How many APs do you think go into a stadium? It's just a, a guess. 500? 1,000? 2,000? Depends on the size of the stadium. Uh, we're working on one in the U.S. that has 1,700 throughout the entire facility. Uh, Kolkata Eden Gardens had 1,000 1, access points, 1,100 uh, throughout the entire facility. Um, Dharamshala, the one I worked on, had 600 APs in, in the bowl for 28,000 people distributed around a cricket field. So it's not actually that dense. You know, the people kind of spread out, but it's, it's a fairly big area to try and meet that requirement. So when you're dealing with such a large number of access points, the primary thing is AP labeling in order to know that the access point you're touching on the controller is actually the real one. So that's the first one. So what we ended up saying to the guys was, 
make really big clear labels, you need to be able to read them from about 15 meters away. If I just stand under the access points, I should be able to see them quite easily. Um, otherwise, you end up climbing up ladders and taking photographs of the access point and trying to prove that it is or isn't the right one. The next thing that you'll find when you do these kind of builds is that the Mac and Serial and the name don't match the asset register. So there's a guy who sits down and he takes the Mac and the serial number of an access point and he gives it a name in a spreadsheet and another guy comes along and he grabs a box and he, off he goes and he disappears somewhere else. And you end up trying to change the channel on the wrong AP later on. So that's the first thing. So these are the kind of keys to making your life a lot easier. So you start off with your Mac and serial name and you make sure that those match the acid register. That usually took us about five days. Um, there was a bit of a language gap, admittedly. Uh, there was also a bit of a reticence to go back and redo the work that they'd done already. <laughs> uh, there were a couple of conflicts there that we had to resolve. But uh, eventually we ended up getting the guys to, to go back and change all of their stuff, put the, put the right labels up, give us a correct asset register and all of that kind of stuff. And then we could feed that into the controller uh, and use our scripts to bring everything up. right? And then we knew it would be right. So... The other thing that you're interested in is, is the minimum RSSI. Just in an empty stadium, just making sure that you've kind of got the right groundwork laid for when the crowd comes in. So the, the key with this is that the noise floor during a game can get up anywhere to about negative 75 dBm. Okay? Can sometimes go higher. So the idea here is you need at least 20 dB to hit your higher modulation schemes, right? Because as soon as you start using lower modulation schemes, your capacity goes for a ball, right? It goes straight through the, through, the, through the chute. So you need to get people on and off the air as fast as you can. If they're getting on, in the, on and off the air very, very slowly and they're using low modulation schemes, everyone else's traffic backs up and congestion takes over and the whole network dies. So that's the key. So you need at least 20 dB SNR for your higher modulation schemes, which means that you need at least negative 55 dBm to your weakest client. So, uh, I don't know how many of you keep your old Android phones. <laughs> I have a few. <laughs> but I use those to, to go and test. And generally, so I, I have a Galaxy S4, I, I have a Nexus 6, which is not that old, but it's kind of a cool, it's a cool phone. And then I have my, my iPhone 6. So I use my Galaxy S4 as a kind of a measure. And, and that kind of gives me an idea of what a four-year-old phone will look like on, on the network. Um, we've seen some phones come in at about 10 dB worse than the Galaxy S4. So the Galaxy S3, if you have any interest in that, is about 10 decibels worse than the Galaxy S4 um, in terms of gem generational thing. I haven't seen any S3s around uh, for a while, so let's try and avoid that. So if you're testing with your MacBook Air, that means you're looking for about negative 45 dBm at least, right? Somewhere around there. Maybe negative, well, hopefully not negative 35 because then you've got to stand right under the access point. But yeah. And then the other big trick that a lot of people forget is they, they put the access point up and they do this kind of overhead design where they, they shoot from either behind the crowd or in front of the crowd. If you're shooting from behind the crowd or you're putting APs under seats, don't forget the body loss. So a lot of guys will do that. They'll go and stand down at the bottom and they'll get negative 45 at the base of this, you know, at the base of the stadium and they'll go, well, this is great. You say, well, no, no, not really, because if you go and sit down and point a laser measure up at the access point, and this is a funny little experiment that we did it from time to time. So you, you take your laser measure and you put it on the stand and you get someone to go and sit in the seats going up the stadium. And he tells you when, well, you tell him when the laser measure is not pointed at his head, right? So as, as soon as the laser measure goes past his head, that's the last body you do. So sometimes you're dealing with as much as... Um, four or five bodies that you've got to go through to get down to the bottom of the stadium, and that's 3 dB per body. So sometimes you're looking at like another 15 dB, so your signal strength really needs to kind of start improving uh, from, from that point. Uh, so, so yeah, you're, you're talking about high signal strengths here, uh, the kind of stuff that would make EM-sensitive people kind of edgy, right? Um, make you want to wear your own tinfoil hat. Okay, so the other thing about transmit power um, and I've, I've made a bit of a joke out of this because I realized as I was doing this image that it looked funny. Um, but the other trick about transmit power is as you raise transmit power to a point, 
um, you get higher signal to noise ratio above your, your normal noise floor, right? Which means you get higher modulation schemes. Your signal to interference noise ratio stays pretty much the same. And, and that comes from a, an interesting interplay because I'm not sure if any of you have ever done this thought experiment, but if you lower your transmit power, your coverage area shrinks, which means you have to put your access points closer together which means your signal to interference noise ratio is exactly the same as it was before. What did you gain? Right? So when you start doing these kind of plans, you, you, you start realizing that by placing access points closer together, you can lower contention inside the BSS, but you're not actually going to lower contention on the same channel because everyone can hear you in a stadium. It's a big open bowl. You've got 10,000 people all using, let's say, channel one. Right, so really lowering your transmit power on your access points not not going to save you that much. So what we found is higher transmit powers in stadiums tend to help with a directional antenna. If you're going to do that, if you've got underseat deployments, lowering your transmit power can help a little bit. Um, but that's that's the kind of balance we found. So you know you kind of have to rob Peter to pay Paul and find out what what the optimal kind of level here is. Uh, in in India, we often found that if we had access points far away we had to turn the transmit power up. And we found if we had access points nearby, we could turn it down with no problem. Who would have thought, right? Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, pretty, a pretty obvious conclusion on that one. Okay. So the next thing we, we want to talk about is infrastructure validation. And this goes towards proving that it's not the Wi-Fi. So the big issue that you have is you've got a customer, he's going to go, the Wi-Fi sucks. And it's your job to say, it's not the Wi-Fi. Uh, M Michal and I were in a, um, a meeting about two weeks ago with a customer. Uh, they had some architectural issue. And every time they turned tunneling on on our controller, they started dropping packets. Right. So the obvious conclusion is that it's the controller. The controller must be dropping the packets. And we ended up tracing all of them through. And we, we ended up getting to a point where we said to them, do you, do you have any policy-based routes on this? On, on this VLAN that's different to the VLAN you're using for local breakout? And the answer came back and went, no, no, of course not. These two VLANs are treated exactly the same way. So we sat with them for the day and we, we followed the packets all the way up through their aggregation switches, through their core switches, through their firewalls, back through their firewalls, back down to their aggregation switches. And at that point, the aggregation switch was sending the same packet to two different core switches at the same time. No one knows why. And that's where the packet was dropping. And it took us a day to prove to them that it was their network and not our Wi-Fi uh, that, that was necessary. So that's, that's the major trick. And that's the kind of reason why we, we go through all of this. And I'll, I'll give you guys some, some tips. So the first thing is cables, media converters, and fiber. Michal had a really interesting interaction he was telling me about last night over dinner. Uh, he was chatting to a customer. And they said, we've got four access points that just won't come up. And they, they followed the cable all the way through and they found the media converters. The media converters were exactly the same as all the others until eventually, about a day later, they found out from one of the installs guys that the four media converters in question had actually been scrapped <laughs> and he had picked them up out of the bin and, and just reused them because they, they seemed fine, right? <laughs> so that kind of thing tends to hap happen quite a lot. Uh, the other thing that we found is that cable validation and certification is not always genuine. It takes time, right? You've got to go and sit with each cable and test it and say, yes, it is, yes, it is, yes, it is, yes, it is. And if, you do, if you're doing a stadium with 1,000 access points, I'm going to take a wild guess here and say that you've probably got to test about two or 3,000 cable endpoints, if probably more. And if you've got to verify every single one of those, there's a guy somewhere who is most likely not going to be very interested in doing that for like two weeks, right? So... That is often, often a big problem. Uh, the Ruckus access points that we install have Zap. They have SpeedFlex. I'm sure you guys have seen the little SpeedFlex app if you've used Ruckus access points. Anyway, SpeedFlex is based on a, a command line tool called Zap. And what Zap does is it's very similar to iPerf uh, in that it does performance tests, but it does a batch of performance tests. So it can run 50 throughput tests in a, in a batch and then it can run up to a thousand of those batches. So you can get a sort of a probability distribution of what kind of throughput you get because every single throughput test is slightly different, right? So we can do those on, on our access points via the cable. 
uh, and we can actually see whether that cable is or isn't responding. Uh, and, and giving us the correct speed. So we then actually do scripted zap testing. So we, we build a little bash script and we say 4i equals 1 to 255 do. And we then run the command for zap to test from a little gigabit ethernet laptop all the way out to every single AP in the subnet uh, while you're connected into an access switch. And what that does for us, is it doesn't only test the cables from the AP to the access switch, it also tests all of the cables between the access switches and the distribution layer, right? Because every single access switch has an uplink uh, connection back to the distribution layer. So we can actually test up and then back down and we can see what it, what's happening there. So if you, get, if you do this test, by the way, and you get really good results for 24 access points and really bad results for all the rest, you're pretty much guaranteed that there's an uplink switch or there's, there's an uplink somewhere that's, that's broken. Or if you get a batch of APs, 24 at a time or 48 at a time that are doing badly, you know that there's another distribution link that's broken. Um, if you're just getting one access point, then you know it's an access link. So there, it takes a little bit of pattern recognition, but you, you can kind of figure out very quickly where the problem is. Um, and and that's, that's basically it. Then what we do is if we get any result lower than 500 megabits per second, we send the guy out and we say, go and recrimp that cable. Go and tell us what's happening there, right? So that basically fix, fixes um, most, of, most of our problems. So there's, there's just a kind of a breakdown of the kind of results that we can see. So um, this is uh, from Dharamshala, I think. And by the time we were done, that was the lowest throughput we were getting on an Ethernet cable um, throughout that west wing. So... Yeah, that's that's just a breakdown. I had to kind of expand it. There are there are a thousand more entries like this. If you really want to go and look at them, I'll give them to you. But <laughs> I think it, it it sort of illustrates the point. Okay, so that's the the first thing we do is the the physical in the physical installation and the the cabling infrastructure validation, just to make sure that no one's going to point the finger at us later and we don't have to go and chase down any of those other issues. Yeah. That would be a tricky, a tricky problem. <laughs> yeah, I, I would, I would end up having to use a cable tester, right, or or something like that. Oh, so so the question was, if I'm not using Ruckus Gear, what would I use to do this? And and that's that's a tricky question. So um, I'm not sure how many access points support iPerf or or anything like that on them. Um, but if you do have iPerf, you can script the same command uh, throughout everything. So this this isn't any kind of like special parallel testing or anything like that. It's just, you know, one by one by one by one. <coughs> Every access point basically gets tested for 20 seconds. So if you've got any gear with an iPerf client on it, you can, you can do exactly the same thing uh, with your laptop, but you'll, you'll need something to do throughput testing. So yeah, this is kind of specific to us and, you know, whether or not you'll be able to do this with another vendor is in question. Yeah, I can't answer that. Okay. So the next thing that we end up looking at, once we've done the physical kind of installation, the AP tilts, transmit power kind of rough estimation and all that kind of thing, is, is the network validation. So we have found a lot of issues with VLANs, uh, policy-based routes, as I mentioned earlier, DHCP, DNS, home-brewed load balances, um, firewalls, <laughs> switches, specifically around all of these little topics at the bottom here. So your CAM tables, your ARP tables, your routing tables, uh, your DHCP scopes, your NAT capacity. What do you have going into the network? And, and one of my favorite stories is uh, happened in the, in the Southeast Asia. We went to go and do a, a basketball arena and we turned the network up, sort of a temporary installation just to prove to the customer that it could work. And we got about an hour into the event with a thousand users online and the whole network took a dump. The whole thing just went down. No one was getting DHCP, no one was getting ops, no one was getting anything. It was dead. So everyone freaked out and we all ran around. And eventually we went and we found the guy who would configured the router uh, going out to, to the internet. And we discovered at that point that he had used a Cisco 3945 branch office's router, right? That has a user limit of about 900. <laughs> I think it's 925, 900, somewhere around there, okay? 
And what he did to test it was he took our network out and he plugged his laptop in and he, he rebooted the router and he went, it's fine. And he plugged our network back in and the router immediately died again because about 2,000 people immediately asked it for a DHCP <laughs> address, right? So that's the kind of thing that you really want to have a look at. Look at your CAM tables, especially if you're doing any kind of local breakout. Um, you'll get some stadiums who'll go and do a virtual controller with some, some APs or something like that, or, or they won't tunnel everything through to the controller. Tunneling in a stadium is a big benefit because it means you don't have to worry about any of the stuff on your access switches, right? Because the access switch just sees the tunnels from the APs. That's all it sees, right? So you don't stress your access switches. As soon as you start doing local breakout, you start having massive issues with cam table updates. Every time I roam between an AP, you know, if I roam from AP to AP, the switches all have to update their cam tables, the distribution switches all have to kind of keep that up. So there's a lot of overhead that goes into the rest of the network if you've got 20,000 people all kind of wandering around moving from access point to access point. So tunneling can help you a lot in, in that kind of a scenario, by the way. Um, but yeah, these these are kind of your typical your your, your typical bugbears, right? That you're going to run into. So that's that's your that's your kind of a thing. Okay. So once you've dealt with your physical network, and believe me, once you've gone through all of this with the customer, it's not done until the event's done, right? So you're going to get an event, and then something here is going to go badly wrong in the middle of the first event, and you're going to have to go back and chase it up and find out what it was and fix it and make sure it all works. But Hopefully, you're kind of in the right area here. Um, oh, wait, one more, one more anecdote, sorry, about load balances. Um, when we were in India, we were tunneling everything from every single stadium back to Mumbai over three 10-gig links that went into each stadium. So they had a VRRP running between their, um, their, they had 3560 switches. They didn't need to be very big switches because we were tunneling everything back to Mumbai, but... Um, that they were running VRRP between the 3560s at each stadium uh, and then kind of moving between the, the 10 gig links, right? And they then pulled everything back to Mumbai where they had a home-brewed load balancer uh, sending everything out to the internet. And we were seeing the weirdest behavior. So we had an access point installed back in, in the kind of back office where there was no interference, no high utilization. The air interface was crystal clear, right? And... We, uh, we were testing on this and we were testing in the stadium and we started noticing that our ping times were varying. Now, typically during our testing, the ping times were 50 milliseconds to Mumbai, right? And suddenly our ping time started going up and our speedflex, uh, sorry, our speedtest.net server location started changing. So that website, by the way, will kind of auto-locate you based on where your traffic pops out. Um, usually it would locate us in Mumbai and suddenly we started kind of popping up in Delhi or Nagpur or other places and we had to start kind of wondering what the hell was going on. Eventually what we found was that one of the load balancers um, wasn't handling the load and was actually just kind of forwarding packets in a sort of a randomized fashion and hitting different parts of their network and then being routed out in really weird ways. So we were getting these kind of strange split routes where the traffic would go out one way and then come back to us in a completely different uh, pattern. And that was a problem with their, their broader uh, network uh, on, the, on the other side of that. So that's, that's another thing just to keep in mind. I mean, it's, it's not just about the LAN or, or anything like that if you're, if you're building this for a carrier. Okay, so talking about the air interface and... And this was the real challenge, right? So this is kind of the meat of the story, I guess. Um, the air interface is a little hard to test in an empty stadium. So how do you, how do you test a stadium, right? I mean, what do you do? Do you go and get 20,000 people on rent a crowd and say, hey, bring your phones, I'll give you 50 bucks each. That's, that's a lot of money, right? I mean, that's $100,000 just for one day. And none of those tests will be repeatable because it's like herding cats. And it's, it's just a mess. So when we were in India, we, we had this team of students. Um, so Reliance had, had basically hired these, these students and uh, they had nothing better to do. So they just shipped them around the country with their, with their phones, right? They basically gave them phones and said, get in this bus and drive until we tell you to stop and don't come back, right? Um, <laughs> so anyway, these, these kids were walking around our stadiums the whole time, testing their phones and stuff. 
And it was an endless headache for us because they would go to an access point, test it, and then raise their hands and go, oh, we had a performance problem here at this access point. And we'd, we'd rush over there and we'd have a look and we'd test everything and we'd realize that five of them were testing at exactly the same time on the same channel. And that explained exactly why they're all getting six megabits per second each on a 20 megahertz wide channel, right, with a single stream client. Uh, you're kind of going, okay. So none of those tests were, were repeatable and none of them were really documented. That was the other thing. So you've got a thousand kids all running around doing their own tests and coming back and they only remember the bad one. So when the guy who's in charge of them says, hey, well, what did you get? He gets, oh, I got 500 kilobits per second. Well, where did you get that? Or oh, everywhere. You know, okay, so this was pointless, right? So here's the challenge. How do you test the air interface in an empty stadium without a crowd? Um, and the thing is, that is the key to building and optimizing your channel plan and transmit power, right? So how do you, how do you actually know if you've built a static channel plan for your stadium and we, we can get into why we don't use automatic channel selection in stadiums over a beer, right? If any of you know Ruckus. Um, but so, so that's the key, right? If you're going to optimize this network, you have to test somehow. And the, the only way to do this is to test with multiple clients on multiple APs at the same time, all on the same channel. So you need something that's controlled and repeatable. So people are expensive. Client devices vary wildly as well. I can't really go and say, well, we'll only test iPhones or we'll only test Android or we'll only test BlackBerry. Does BlackBerry even still exist? It does in Africa, um, but not anywhere else. Um, or, you know, so, so how do you do this and, and how do you choose something sensible? So what we settled on as a team, um, and, and this is actually down to, to my boss, Jared, and, and one of our colleagues, Prashant, um, but what we found worked really, really well was doing uh, limited client testing using a sort of a standard or generic client, okay? So what we did was we took a um, script package where we took iPerf and we, we turned, uh, we built a script package around iPerf that allowed us to run multiple iPerf sessions in parallel or in serial, okay? So we can, we can choose to run those in series or we can run them in parallel. And we then took a, mo a modified Ruckus R300 uh, with a battery. So we plugged a little battery into the back of an R300 access point and we got our guys in the development center to hack into the R300. And this is where Ruckus's history as a, a CPE vendor actually kind of pays off. I'm not sure if any of you remember that. Like way back when, sort of six years ago, we used to sell these little home gateways and CPEs to guys like Deutsche Telekom and you know all the rest. Uh, anyway, so it turns out you can still get into one of our access points and tell it that it's a 7111. So it changes its model number. It suddenly gets a little schizophrenic and thinks it's a client, right? And we can kind of fidget those clients. So we can actually fidget them between 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. We can set them to be one or two spatial streams. Uh, we set a little special SSID in the, uh, in, in the access point. So basically what you do is you publish a, a special SSID like Ruckus 2 or Ruckus 5. And... When you turn these things on as a client, they'll automatically associate to the SSID you've told them to use. So we have a pack of about, how many of it was, 50? 50 of those clients that we could go and put down. And because we can do the special SSID and the connection, we can control which access points they connect to and which channel they use and all that kind of stuff. So if, if I wanted to, I could go and put that special SSID on all of the APs running channel one, for instance, right? Uh, and we can go from there. The... The trick with this testing that we did, and, and, and this was the little gotcha that came up, when you're in a stadium, um, typically you set OFDM only, and you set your minimum rate to somewhere between 6 and 24 megabits per second. Uh, you know, everyone here is going to have their own flavor of that. We found that 12 megabits per second dead in the middle worked really, really well for us. <clears throat> the problem we have is when we set these clients uh, to, to, to this mode, they will only associate to an SSID that is beaconing at two megabits per second. So you have to be very, very careful not to make this setting go out to the entire bowl at once because otherwise your channel utilization goes to 99% based purely on beacons, right? And that's a nightmare. So you need to kind of bring yourself back down to something sensible. So your, your channel utilization from management is only somewhere around about 25 to 30%, um, which for a stadium is not too bad. Um, okay, 
so that's the first thing uh, that we that we did. Um, then we we ran the scripts. So you plug your laptop into the access switch, and you plug the access points into the network, and you well you you get these client devices connected. Um, these results look really nice, um, but this this entry here at the bottom where it says connection failed, operation timed out. Okay, that was our major bug. We've got all of these perfect little generic clients sitting around. You have to make sure that they're all connected before you run your test. Otherwise, you get this, and then you have to rerun your test. Uh, the test also takes a while. So the first test we, we did was we ran it in series. So we, we did our run iperf.sh uh, uh, space minus s. That's for serial. And then we had the station IP list, and we had the West stand. And you can see what each, what each uh, client was getting in terms of throughput on the 2.4 gigahertz band. That was testing one at a time, right? So one by one by one by one by one in a nice clean stadium. So that, that's just your single client testing. And we came out a wonderful 902 megabits per second for, I don't know how many clients it was. I think that was 20, judging by it, right? So we came out at 902 megabits per second. The customer went, great. We went, no, no, wait, hold on, hold on, stop. This is the test you're interested in. This test has one very important difference, is that we set it to dash minus P, which runs all of the tests in parallel. So all of them run at the same time, on the same channel, next to each other throughout the stadium. So basically, you, you choose a whole bunch of APs all on channel one, and you go boom, 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 all the way out. And that's what you start to see uh, from, from the beauty of uh, best effort service on Wi-Fi. So one of our stations was getting 4.8 megabits per second. And one of our stations was getting 52, right? They're all on different APs, but they're all kind of on the same channel. So that, that's the, the major difference. And that's what we were starting to do. So we then pulled that out and we said, okay, well, you're getting 400 megabits per second now as an average. So that means that we're getting a decent amount of isolation on this channel between APs, right? So if every single AP and clients are talking at the same time, where are we coming out in terms of our, our total average, and then we kind of took a mean of that. Obviously, we went back and had a look at these guys, right? You look at like, your worst three, four there. The, the goal we were aiming for was 10 megabits per second, by the way. So yeah, uh, question? Oh yeah, like a bunch of times. So I'm, I'm, I'm showing you, I'm, I'm showing you one, one set of results. So sometimes what we would find is, and, and this is quite funny, You'd go and put this access point down right in front. Well, you go and put this client down right in front of the access point you want it to connect to. You turn it on, and you find out later that it's connected to an access point on the other side of the stadium. Right. Or it's gone and connected to something like way down and some, somewhere else. Am I doing something wrong here? OK, sorry. I thought I was fidgeting the microphone. But yeah, so, so we'd find like clients that associated to the wrong access point. Sometimes we'd find that we had two access points, you know, channel one, channel one. We'd kind of go, where the hell did that happen? Because that wasn't expected. And we'd go back to the asset register and then back to our channel plan and kind of fidget that around and stuff like that. Uh, sometimes we'd dial the transmit power down or dial it up just to see what we could get uh, on these results. Typically, we found that if we just pushed the transmit power up as high as we could, um, we got better results while all of them were talking. Um, the, the, the reason for that is because it, when you're trading contention versus uh, modulation, if l let's say both of us talk at the same time, right? And we're going to use probably the same frequencies in, in the audio range. If I talk really loudly here to these guys and you talk really loudly there to those guys, there is going to be a considerable amount of noise coming from your area of the room but I'm pretty sure that all of you guys will hear me quite clearly and will decode the message, and I should be able to drown you out. So as long as I'm using a directional antenna and as long as the physics works, uh, we can turn the transmit power up fairly high to, to push the transmit, uh, to push the throughput up in the network. Um, but the, the physics has to work, right? You can't, you, know, you can't just push transmit power up and say, ha-ha, it works now. Um, so some advice when you're doing this kind of testing, if you want to do this kind of client testing, um, now that you all have an OC droid, the idea is maybe you could go and get 50 OC droids and do this. <laughs> uh, and you wouldn't have to do it only with you know special source from Ruckus. But um, remember the batteries. Don't forget the batteries. We forgot the batteries. We know 
how hard this is. It's awful. <laughs> we, we ended up building these homemade octopus cables out of power cables. Uh, and, and we had these, these dudes sitting kind of like building them. And you can see what they've done with the insulation tape and the cable ties. So that, that is only one of 10 um, octopuses that we kind of strung together. And it turned into this giant clump of cable that we had to lug around. Um, and then what we did was we plugged all of those. You see, we plugged all of those into one plug point, And then we plugged all of the little octopus tentacles into PoE injectors, and then we ran PoE cables to all of the, uh, the clients to get them to work. Laying out the PoE cables took us nearly seven hours <laughs> for 50 clients, because you gotta run up the stadium and through, and you gotta go and drop them through the, the chairs and things like that. It was an absolute nightmare. Michal and I, like, we, we just, we tore our hair out. We did one test run uh, that day, and we just said, okay, just pack it up, we're done. We're gonna go and drink wherever we can find alcohol, right? We're, we're out, we're out. So, so that, was the <laughs> that was the major thing. Um, okay, then, so, so once you've done your client testing and you've optimized your, your channel plan and your transmit power and all of that kind of stuff and you've got a rough idea of what to expect during a game, um, we then go into final validation. And that, unfortunately, there's no other way to get around it. You have to do this in an event. You, you kind of, it's kind of like, going running every day and eventually you go, maybe I should do a marathon, right? Or maybe I should actually go and do a race. Uh, you've, you've kind of got to get yourself to the point where you think you're ready and then you've just got to take the plunge and go, okay, well, I, I assume that I've read and learned enough that I can make this work if something goes wrong. So that's the key. So you do in-event testing and optimization um, and this is where we do our roaming optimization, right? Um, the reason why we don't do any roaming optimization or anything like that before is because Apple devices and other devices will typically only look for a roam trigger when they hit neg 70 dB, right? In a stadium, in an empty stadium. That happens like miles away from the access point you're supposed to be connected to in a stadium. I mean, you, you will walk in an... If, if you think about it, a stadium is effectively just a big open space with... 500 access points, all within line of sight, right? You could probably cover an entire stadium with two or three access points if you just pick them up and put them down. So you, you're not going to get very good roaming in an empty stadium. People are going to get stuck to the wrong AP. They're going to try and associate to the wrong one. So what ends up happening is as the crowd comes in and as people start using the Wi-Fi and as the noise floor comes up to NEG 75, suddenly you can't hear that access point at neg 70 very clearly anymore. Suddenly you can't hear that other access point at neg 80 or neg 76 or anything like that. And suddenly your client device starts being forced to roam a lot more aggressively and you start end up having to move at neg 65 or neg 60 sometimes even. Um, so your, your client device roaming behavior sort of changes as the stadium fills up. And that's what we've noticed is um, you know, when we walk around in an empty stadium, we end up always kind of hanging on to the wrong access point and our throughput goes all the way down. When the stadium fills up and we get a lot of people, our roaming performance actually improves because the client device has to kind of be aware of what's happening around it. It starts dropping uplink packets faster because of the noise floor and things like that. Um, we have something from our vendor called Smart Roam. Uh, a lot of other vendors have this like roaming capabilities. I know Aruba has it, I know Cisco have, it, have, it, have a similar thing. Um, ours is affectionately known as Pratiba's Hammer uh, because she was the one who developed it. So she was this really cool uh, wireless LAN developer we had for a while. And what she did was she said, okay, if a client does not attempt to roam by a certain RSSI threshold, I'm gonna kick it off the network. Regardless of whether it supports 11V or not, I'm just gonna boot the damn thing. So what we did is we, we built a scale from zero to 10, right? Seems intuitive. And, and we usually set this to three. So if you're working with Ruckus, you set it to three. If you're working with other vendors, you'll, you'll set your roam threshold slightly differently uh, based on client support for things like 11V or not or all of that kind of thing. So that's, that's uh, where we do our roaming optimization is during the event. And we actually walk around with a phone and we do something like, you know, start a FaceTime call, phone someone, start a WhatsApp call, start something continuous and then just move and see if that FaceTime call stands up. So we, we did that recently with a, with a customer in the US and it worked out pretty well. We were doing HD FaceTime calls uh, to, to people's parents in France, which was quite fun. Um, 
So then the next step is we do spectrum and protocol analysis during the event. So we want to make sure that everyone's on their nice regulated channels, 1, 6, and 11. Uh, we don't find that there's very much benefit in 1, 5, 9, and 13. Um, often we find that clients just don't scan 12 and 13, and they just kind of drop off, and they fall in these little black holes. Um, so we, we've stuck with that. Um, and we, we try to make sure that everything's working on the right channel. We're not getting any kind of external interference uh, or anything like that. Another big thing here is try and make sure that you use a really good spectrum analyzer. Um, I, I spent two hours one day running around a stadium with my uh, cheaper spectrum analyzer wondering what was going on. And it turned out that all it was was aliasing from the, you know, from the spectrum analyzer, the way it was processing the, the data, you, you just kind of end up having this big lobe of, of what looks like interference, but it's actually just badly processed data on the, on the spectrum analyzer. So yeah, that, that was an annoying goose chase. Um, but yeah, have a look at your protocol analysis, try and make sure that you're not getting 11, any 11B, one, two megabit per second kind of stuff, make sure that everything's running on you know, OFDM only with your minimum rate set, all of that kind of thing. Uh, we also walk around doing throughput testing on phones. So we just pick phones up at random and do throughput tests. We talk to the crowd as well. So we say, hey, have you used the Wi-Fi? What do you think of it? What's going on? Have you seen any issues? Uh, anything like that. That's a very good measure um, just to try and get an idea of what people are saying about it and what they're doing with it. Uh, if, if you have no other option, try and tell them to use it. You know, Just say, hey, why? Go for it, use the Wi-Fi, it's free or whatever, uh, just to try and get them on because that always helps with your stats and reports at the end, right? Because everyone wants to stand up and say, hey, we moved three terabytes of traffic with only four people, you know, or something like that. Um, <laughs> so that's the key. Uh, and then obviously you have your stats and reports. So in, in your stats and reports to the customer, you're always going to have things like, you know, what was the band split? How many clients did you get at the maximum? How did you get, how many did you get uh, sort of as a minimum? Um, you know, how much data did they move? Who were the top 10 clients? Who were the worst 10 clients? Uh, what the, the worst 10 clients is always going to be weird because you're going to have like some guy standing outside of the stadium going, this sucks, man. You're going, well, yeah, no doubt because you're not even in the stadium. But um, having a look at all of that, and then this is the kind of graph we ended up giving to our customer um, on, on, one of the, on one of the stadiums. So we broke everything up into different uh, regions. Uh, so into different areas. So we had the outdoor areas, the press box, stand A, B, C, D, E, F, G, M, N, and P. I think this was Bangalore, actually. Uh, and then we, we took the average throughput um, for each area for each hour. And, and we had a look at that and we said, okay, we just want to see if we saw any big dips in this. And you could see we were kind of maintaining, I think the worst day stand we had was stand G, um, where we, we were sitting just above 10 megabits per second. Uh, that, that stand, funnily enough, actually had a design uh, problem. We were only able to put access points at the back of the stadium uh, for that stand. And the distance to the furthest client was about 20 meters, which in a stadium is just a no-no, right? That's too far away. So you, you kind of end up with this situation where you're kind of going, well, it's, it's as good as it's going to get. Um, but yeah, so our, our average throughput, if I have a look at it, if I go and try and hunt down the, num the line, I think, this was, I think this was our average over here, or maybe the blue line behind there. Uh, but we ended up kind of sitting somewhere around about 15 to 20 megabits per second on average for the entire venue for the evening uh, as the client expected throughput. So that is all I have. And as far as I'm aware, that's 53 minutes and 33, 34 seconds, um, <laughs> which is good. Um, any questions? Okay, uh, we have a mic. It'll help for the recording. Uh, by the way, while I'm passing the mic, uh, average MCS rates, average retries during these tests? So uh, we, we can have a look at it. Um, so the average MCS rates, I can't really speak to. Um, you know, we were getting an average throughput of about 10. We didn't look at the average MCS. We're not able to pull that out that granularly. Uh, from the reporting tool we were using. But the, the average retry rates that we were seeing some, somewhere around about 30% to 40% on retries when the stadium's full. So your management overhead is about 30%. Your retry rate is about 30 to 40%. And what you've got left is usable airtime, right? So you end up with about 30%. Um, I suppose that, that speaks to what some could call the, the fallacy of multi-user MIMO uh, coming later on, is, is that 
you, you've only got 30% of your airtime left in a stadium. How much of that do you want to donate to signaling to get the multi-user MIMO to maybe work, right? So if, if I had a choice, I'd take a two-by-two two phone over a one-by-one one phone with multi-user MIMO any day. Okay. Um, but yeah, that was, that was basically what we saw. So what was the uh, noise floor at the empty stadium with no Wi-Fi traffic being going? Oh, so in, in an empty stadium from just management overhead, we were seeing about 30% utilization, but the noise floor was way down, about neg 85, neg 90, really quiet by the time we got it done. On the five gig band, look, five, five gig is easy, guys, because there's, there's lots of channels, right? 2.4 is where it was, was really bad. So if I kind of quote these numbers, this is 2.4. Uh, five gig management overhead was probably about 5%, you know, really, really low. The retry rates were about 15% around there. So it's, it's pretty, pretty clean in an empty stadium. Um, when we walked into a few of the stadiums, it was way worse. Like uh, we, we've seen some stadiums where we've walked in without optimization happening, and our utilization's already at like 20% on five gig, and our retry rates are at 40 or 50%. And when you're, you know, when you're seeing retried packets and all you've got is management overhead, kind of makes you scratch your head and think like, what the hell's going on? But yeah, that's that's it. All right. Uh I have a question actually too. Uh, five gigahertz, you already mentioned that, mm -hmm. but you mentioned 2.4 all the time in your mm -hmm. slides. Mm -hmm. What was the, the breakout there? Just curious. And another question yeah. is what encryption did you go for? Okay, so the encryption was nothing. Uh, what we did was we had, a, we had a captive portal and Keith is like crawling in his skin right now, I know. Um, but what, what they did with the guys is they said, okay, Come up to the captive portal, put down your mobile phone number, give us your country code and everything. We will send you an SMS. So I could walk into the stadium. I would give them my phone number, which covers them for lawful intercept purposes. I would get an SMS with a short code. I would punch that into the, the web portal, and I would then be authenticated for eight hours in, in the same venue. So I could walk around that stadium testing and, and doing whatever I had to do. Uh, so that's how they did that. The breakout between 2.4 and 5, Typically, when we run dual band deployments like this, we see about 30% of the clients on 5 gig. But most of my examples come from kind of developing markets where your, your client devices are cheaper. Uh, if we do projects in the US, it's vastly different. Like we can actually get to the point where we just turn 2.4 off and go, you know what, I can guarantee you a better performance on 5 and I know that I'm not going to drop half of my clients. So... I can, I can just push you out on five and, and off we go. So we did a stadium deployment recently where we just t turned 2.4 off because the, the risk of someone with an iPhone 6 or 6S or something like that connecting to 2.4 instead of 5 and then having a bad experience was just not worth it. Um, but yeah, if, if you're left with no other option, you, you kind of have to stick it out, right? Uh, first off, it's awesome to see all the, the real-world data and uh, to hear your experience and your story. It seems like one of the major challenges is in that simulation and that testing. Um, I know there's like some packages like testing on demand distributed and there's more open source tools wrapping up things like iPerf. But um, is there any, I mean, if you had to do it all again or if you had unlimited budget or in terms of efficiency, how do you think would be the fastest way to test at scale? I mean, you had the luxury of being able to switch some of the APs right into client mode, essentially. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, if you had unlimited budget, or, or you know, if you wanted to do it faster, what what could you have done? I'd hire more people to drag those clients out to the seats. Um, uh, so, so I'm I'm a big fan of uh, verifying everything I see. Um, so, so that's just my my approach. I, I like the simulation tools. I like what um, tools like Echohow and IBWave and those guys bring to the, the, the party. Uh, but I always want to just make sure that I'm getting something realistic. So I don't think I'd ever not do real client testing and optimization just to make sure everything was right, just so that I've covered all the real world kind of aspects of it. Um, if I could, I would, I mean, I'm from a vendor, right? So it's, it's easy for me to stick with the R300, but taking my vendor hat off, if I had unlimited budget, I would go for a whole bunch of little credit card sized devices. And you, you're going to be sure that those things are going to have the worst Wi-Fi you've ever seen in your life, right? In comparison to a smartphone. So you go and get a whole bunch of those, maybe Raspberry Pis or OC Droids or something like that. Get a batch of 50 of them, flash them with an image uh, that you can kind of reach out to. Uh, you can then 
because they're all running Linux, you can kind of configure them with whichever security protocol you want. You can configure them with whichever SSID you want. Uh, you can set them all up as clients. They'll run the right way. You can even do a BSSID block on them, so you can push them to a specific AP, which will avoid some of the issues we had. Uh, because we were using R300s, we, you know, we're kind of limited in what we can and can't do with them, so we had to kind of trick them into thinking they were something else. Um, so that's that's the first thing. I'd, I'd try and do it with, with another set of uh, client devices, maybe give me a bit more flexibility in terms of the security protocols and uh, especially especially the um, the management overhead and the, the beaconing rate. So like that was the other problem with the R300. Is it only connected to something that was using a two megabit per second beaconing, right? If I could make it connect to something that was using 12 megabits per second as a BSS min rate, that would be way better, right? So then I could actually test what my performance would be in my more ideal scenario or, you know, my real life scenario. So those were some of the caveats with our testing. But yeah. Uh, I'd like to make a remark on that last point. This yeah. question that was asked. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I did in the past was not a stadium, but a large university. And what I did was take a bunch of IT students, yeah. which like uh, 50, 60, 70 of students with all different devices, give them study points to actually compete to okay. get some good results out of the Wi-Fi testing and let them make the documentation and do stuff for you, which saves you a lot of money. Um, but then you get a large uh, diversity of clients versus all bad clients uh, yep. or clients that perform worse than you actually might expect from a client. Mm -hmm. Plus the fact that you actually help them study and get some good Wi-Fi knowledge in the field later on. So it's a yep dual benefit to my point of view. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, the, the only thing we're really trying to do when we, when we do this kind of a validation is give the customer the worst case. So we're saying to them, look, hopefully life will be better than this, what we give you, right? So if we, if we do it with the R300s, that was exactly why we were knocking them all down to single stream instead of dual stream, is we're trying to say, look, this is a, a single stream 11 n client. It's kind of middle of the road. <coughs> um, and, and we're trying to give them a, a rough measure because when, when you're in sales engineering, which is sort of what I do, you, you have to be able to uh, un under promise and over deliver. And that's always where sales engineers go wrong, right? They go, oh, no, of course it can do that. And you go, no, 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 don't, don't say that. Never, never say that, <laughs> right? So you kind of want to, if, if I say to a customer, hey, we got 10 megabits per second on our results, I really want to make sure that that is the worst result that customer is ever going to see from another client. Or you know, 90% of the time, so that at least you know he'll he'll be willing to accept that the the other bad results are an anomaly, um, and that's the that's the trick. Is it's it's kind of about positioning. So I'm I'm always a bit scared of more capable clients. That's why I never use my Nexus Six for you know throughput testing with a customer. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, I had a customer who who made me guarantee they had S ones work. It only costs a hundred thousand dollars more than an S three. Um, anyway, thank you very much.